Hey everyone, Dr. Backbencher here, and today we'll be studying primary close angle glaucoma, right? In the previous uh, lecture, we studied primary open angle glaucoma. Here, the angle is closed. So, what is a primary angle closure glaucoma? I copied the exact definition from the first one. First of all, it's an optic neuropathy, right? First thing. Number second, it is characterized by increased intraocular pressure. Second point, visual field defects. Third point, with a tighter than normal angle, right? This is where I wrote it different, right? In the first one, the angle was normal, but because here's the angle closure part, right? So tighter than normal angle. So here's the thing about primary angle closure glaucoma, that it affects women four times as much as men. Let's talk about the factors which would predispose you to the formation of angle closure glaucoma, to the development of angle closure glaucoma, right? These include stuff like age, of course, the older you grow, the more you chance of, have, of, of developing glaucoma. Sex, as I said, four ratio one, right? Female and male. Race, there's a high chance that if you're a if you're Asian, Southeast Asian, to be more specific, like people of Indonesia and Malaysia, right? Asian people are more affected. Compare that to uh, primary open angle glaucoma in which the most affected population was African Americans. And of course, there are certain conditions which cause midriasis, right? And all of these conditions can lead to primary angle closure glaucoma. Remember, remember from the first lecture when we said that medriasis exacerbates glaucoma, right? So if there are certain conditions inside a, uh, in, a, in a guy which can cause medriasis, for example, number one, let's say he, he consistently lives in low light, right? So low light. Second thing is if he is a nervous guy, if, it all, if, if he's a, you know, a guy who takes a lot of stress. So we know that the, the 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 autonomic nervous system which is active in stress is of course the sympathetic autonomic nervous system so as a result what will happen is he will have increased sympathetic or no, sympathetic tone and we know that the sympathetic nervous system opens up the eyelid right it causes medriasis so and medriasis of course exacerbates glaucoma and the third factor is of course if you use um drugs which causes medriasis, right? Drugs which stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. That will also cause medriasis, right? And it will lead to glaucoma, of course. So low light environment. Second could be um, increased sympathetic tone. Excuse my writing. I'm a doctor after all. Uh, and of course, then there's a third one, which is using drugs which could, call, which could cause medriasis medriatic drugs is that even a word i'm not sure meiotic drug is a word but but you know you get the point right so these four conditions could cause could lead to glaucoma right then there are certain anatomical factors right there are certain things inside the eye the way the eyeball is structured which could lead which could predispose us to glaucoma and these include stuff like eyeball length right so if you have a if you have an increased eyeball length, there's a low chance of you uh, developing glaucoma. If you have a decreased in anterior chamber depth, there is an increased chance of you developing glaucoma. If you have a narrow chamber angle, right, the, or the iridocorneal angle, then there's a high chance that you'll develop glaucoma. Now, this one is pretty obvious, right? Narrow angle, of course, you know, if the angle is narrow, it will cause glaucoma. We all know that. But these two things, they're kind of related, right? Eyeball length and anterior chamber depth. Let me have a black screen for a second, right? Let me draw two diagrams real quick. So let's let's imagine a guy who has this eyeball, right? And, and let's exaggerate the eyeball very much just to make our point clear. Let's say I'm drawing this eyeball. Here's the iris. Here's the cornea, of course. Here's the other iris. So uh, and, and here's the ciliary body. Of course, we have the lens here, okay, and, and and over here we have the retina. Here's a normal. Here's let's say here's a guy with a normal. See, let's say, let's say this is a guy with a normal eyeball, okay. 
<laughs> sorry for the diagram it sucks I know but just making it quick and we know there is a drainage system here and a drainage system here as well imagine a guy with a relatively short eyeball right let's say this is his eyeball let's say that's his cornea of course and then over here we have the lens here's the ciliary body and here's the retina ah I just made a mess of it right but you can understand so here's a, a relatively short one and here's a long eyeball right so what did we see we said that if a guy has a longer eyeball his chances of developing glaucoma are substantially less and you can understand that why see this guy has a long eyeball right and this guy over here has a short eyeball now here's the drainage system down here up here you can see because this this eye is kind of all squeezed in together right uh, it's all shrink together so there's this uh, there is a possibility that the flow of fluid over here and 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 uh, this is angle this might be a bit narrow than a guy who has for example a long eyeball right so so a guy who has a longer eyeball he has less chance of developing glaucoma eyeball length right the longer you have the eyeball the less you are prone to develop angle closure glaucoma right so small small eyeballs right let me write small with it small eyeball length right shallow anterior chamber depth right these are the conditions which could lead to angle closure and then of course will lead to glaucoma let's move forward let's talk about the stages of primary angle closure glaucoma these are very important right so primary angle closure glaucoma is not like primary open angle glaucoma it can it can come in many different flavors like these five flavors here stages there is a latent stage latent PACG I'll call it PACG but I mean primary angle closure glaucoma all the time so there's a latent stage there's a subacute PACG there's an acute PACG right is, this one is very very important actually so we need to pay a lot of attention to this one sorry my lines are kind of messed up today we have chronic primary angle closure glaucoma we have the end stage the absolute glaucoma right let's 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 start with with this one right here so latent primary angle closure glaucoma the mildest of them all what happens in this is you do not have any symptoms at all right not observed symptoms are not observed but of course you can force some symptoms you can elicit some symptoms right provocative test in which you provoke the symptoms and of course the provocative test will be positive in a guy who has a latent PACG that's because the gonioscopy reveals a tighter than normal angle right so there is a problem there is a problem all right but it does not have any symptoms unless you elicit it by force okay and the symptoms are there because gonioscopy that we will study this procedure in detail uh, in, 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 the, in the later lectures but this method which is which, which is used to measure the angle right now this this method reveals that there's a tighter than normal angle see no symptoms the intraocular pressure is normal right but the reason you have to treat it is because it could progress to the next stages right the next more severe stages how would you how would you treat this well there's this very nice procedure called iridotomy and it's basically cutting a hole in the iris or puncturing the iris so if you have a hole in the iris even if the the angle gets a bit close there's a chance that the fluid will freely cross that place it'll go freely inside so this is the angle right even if it's a bit tighter if you punch a hole right through here so the fluid over here even if this angle gets a bit tighter it'll still be able to drain inside the canal of Schlem to the trabecular measure of course you can do this by two ways of course there's surgery and then there's also laser laser therapy right puncturing the iris by two ways surgery and laser that is latent PACG no symptoms normal intraocular pressure but a little bit of an abnormal angle right and it could progress to a much severe thing what is the next severe thing well that's the subacute primary angle closure glaucoma right it's a bit more severe in which you experience symptoms right in the previous one you had no symptoms in this one you do have symptoms and this is also called um, another name given to it is intermittent and we know that intermittent means something which is you know sometimes it's on sometimes it's off right so intermittent you see there are certain attacks of glaucoma certain attacks in which the intraocular pressure is increased there is pain there's halos and blurred vision right 
and then the attack usually breaks down all by itself. So, on off, right? Intermittent, subacute. It starts out and it finishes off all by itself. So, during an attack, intraocular pressure is increased, of course. There is pain, perception of halos, and blurred vision. Okay? An attack usually breaks down after one to two hours. And after the attack, the intraocular pressure remains normal. So, in this guy, if he is not having an attack, everything seems normal, everything seems okay. Until, of course, if you provoke that guy, do some provocative test, or, uh, or if you do gonioscopy, that is, if you check the angle of this guy, the angle will be problematic. Let's study it in a little bit more detail. Let's study this attack. How does this attack progress, and how does intraocular pressure increase in this attack? Let's study this for a second. So, pathogenesis. See, here's the problem. Physiological metriasis. This is the biggest problem. This elicits all the symptoms. We know already that there is a shallow angle, right? There is a problem in the angle. But the moment you cause metriasis, as we all know, metriasis is when the pupil goes from a small to a big, right? It, it, it opens up. And because when it opens up, remember, remember that diagram which I drew in which I said that, you know, the iris goes from this long, thin one and into something this, this is very thick and short, right? Remember the, the, the diagram that I made in the last one? In the last video so that's the, that's that's the problem there is metriasis which is blocking the angle a little bit but here is something that we did not actually discuss relative pupillary block how would how would metriasis cause a block in the pupil what does even blocking a pupil actually mean let's talk about it let me make that very simple diagram again once again see what happens in some people there is very little space in between these two okay let me draw what i mean so let's say there's this guy who has a very tight space in between these two, okay? Just like that, between the lens and the iris. And in fact, the, the space is actually quite tight. It's not so loose. So there is a, so let, let, let's, let's take aqueous humor. And we know that aqueous humor is produced here and it flows all the way out here, right? And it, of course, from here and very tightly, it goes all the way out here. And then is of course absorbed by the uh, trabecular meshwork and into that whole network that we talk, that we studied. Now, if, if there is a, a metriasis in this guy, right? Now we know that in metriasis these pupils kind of thicken, thicken up, right? What will happen as a result is here is iris, and it will touch the pupil, right? The iris, sorry, uh, not the pupil. Uh, I mean the lens. So the iris will make contact with the lens when it gets thicker, right? When we are doing metriasis. You can see it here. The iris is making contact. See? There is absolutely no space. So the water, the aqueous humor which is here, it cannot get out, right? That is its only way. It cannot get out of here. And that is a big problem. This condition is called relative pupillary block, right? So the pupil is blocked by the lens or the flow of aqueous humor is blocked by the lens or by the iris, right? And as a result, there is less flow of, of, of fluid from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber, right? Of course, this is complete. So this condition is called relative pupillary block. But then, after some time, something new happens because there is increased pressure here because there's, of course, a lot of fluid accumulating here, it keeps on pressurizing everything. As a result, it kind of forces the eyelid to, uh, sorry, the iris towards the outside, right? So this fluid over here, it's kind of pushing on the iris, okay? Let me draw that properly. There is fluid here, there is increased pressure of fluid, and it is causing pressure on the eyelid. Uh, oh, sorry, I mean the iris, okay? As a result, this iris kind of bulges towards the outside, right? Same as the case here. A lot of pressure, a lot of pressure. It forces the iris to move towards the outside. As a result, what will we see next is we will see a little bit of angle closure, right? Because the iris has been pushed towards the outside. What we will see is a little bit of a bulge. Okay? A little bit of a bulge because of the pressure. This bulging out of the iris is called iris bomb or bombi. 
Well, let me confirm if this is Iris Bomb or Bombi. I have to confirm it. Give me a second. So I just confirmed it. It's it's Bomb, right? It's not called Bomb B. <laughs> so Iris Bomb is the condition in which, as we saw, oh, where's the diagram? Oh, I think I think I did away with the diagram. But anyways, you understood that because of the building of water, because of the building of pressure behind in the posterior chamber, it forced the iris to bulge out a little bit. And this bulging out, this phenomenon is called iris bomb, right? And then of course, when there's iris bomb, we know that there's a shallowing of the angle, right? The, sh the angle gets a bit shallow. Of course, it's bulging outside, right? As a result of that, as a result of that, we will have increased intraocular pressure. So, subacute primary angle closure glaucoma occurs when there is medriasis, all right, and medriasis causes all these problems. So what will happen if we if we actually you know f finish this medriasis here? If we if we do meiosis, well, meiosis reverses all these changes. So if a guy has a bit of a glaucoma, right, and he has medriasis, which causes a pupillary block and increased intraocular pressure, he could flash a few lights on himself, right, and as a result. Uh, his his pupil would go from big to small, and when it gets small, all of his problems will be relieved because of course because it when it when it gets thinner, it will not block the pupil. It will be thin, right? And there will be no block of fluid, blo blocking of fluid. There will be no iris bomb. As a result, increased ocular pressure will not be there. So meiosis, physiological meiosis, right? If you go into bright light, subacute PACG will vanish, just like magic. Treatment is of course going out in the sunlight that that's the number one treatment but you could use alternatively meiotic drugs right drugs which cause meiosis and you can use them during the attack of course and to permanently rel relieve the patient of subacute pacg you can of course puncture the iris right just like in the, in the in the first example as a result even if it gets thick if it rubs against the lens there will be a way for the fluid to get out and no iris bomb and no increase in intraocular pressure Simple as that, nothing difficult.